Hello and welcome to Calvary Online. My name is Graham and I'll be your host today. My family and I have been attending Calvary Gospel Church for about four and a half years now. We'd like to give a warm welcome to our guests. We'd like to get to know you more, so please go to our website and click on the I'm New Connect tab. Also, thank you to our Calvary family for your generosity. Your generosity is allowing our ministry to continue. Our ministry is to love God, to love people, to transform lives. If you'd like to learn more about giving, please go to our website and click on the Give tab. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the service. Hi, Calvary kids. It's Mrs. Davies and Isaac here with today's mini Bible lesson, live on location in Ephesus in a tent. Today, Pastor Andrew is going to be teaching from Acts chapter 18 and 19. Now, is Acts in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Does anybody know? The New Testament! The New Testament. Awesome, thanks. Today's passage is taking place towards the end of Paul's second missionary journey. He met a couple called Priscilla and Aquila. Now this was a really cool married couple. They actually made tents for a living. That was their job. What's cool about Priscilla and Aquila is they are an awesome team. They work together, making tents, sharing their faith and encouraging other Christians in the new church. Now, in Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 24, we see Priscilla and Aquila meet a man named Apollos. Okay, Apollos was a very smart, educated Jewish man, and he was going around te teaching people about God with lots of enthusiasm. And Priscilla and Aquila heard him teaching in the synagogue. They noticed that Apollos' message was a little bit incorrect about baptism. So he didn't quite understand baptism properly. Now, did Aquila and Priscilla yell at him in front of the crowd and correct him and tell him to get lost? No, they didn't. You know what they did? They invited him over to their house and they had a nice talk to him about it. They came alongside him and loved him and showed him what he wasn't quite understanding about baptism. Okay, so a really good example of that. And you know what? Apollos was encouraged and he kept on teaching others. So what can we learn from Priscilla and Aquila? Okay, the first thing is Priscilla and Aquila were rocking the Great Commission. Now, I hope you remember from last week, the three kind of main points we talked about in the Great Commission. It was go and make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them to obey God's commands. Okay, so that's really awesome. Priscilla and Aquila were doing really great with that. Okay, they were going around to different cities with Paul sometimes, making tents and sharing their faith. And they showed how they um, taught other Christians and came alongside them and loved them when they gently corrected Apollos. Okay, now also in, um, in uh, this passage, we see just a really good example of two people working together and using their gifts and their job and still being able to go around and tell people and share their faith. It was a really cool example of that as well, just using what skills you have to teach others about God. So I hope you can learn more from Pastor Andrew's message and from reading your Bible. Check out the children's resources that can be found online. Ask your parents to print out the things to go with the message. And we hope you have an awesome week this week. Thanks, Calvary kids. Bye. Good morning, and let me add my welcome to Graham's and to Melissa's. My name's Andrew, and I'm the pastor here at Calvary, and I'm so glad that you've joined us. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, skip back to the very start of the service and check out some of those announcements. Uh, we're going to try to do a special family event, social distancing style, and we hope that you can join us. At this point in our service, though, I just want to stop and, and take some time to reflect and, and have a family chat for a second. Uh, by now you've heard uh, of George Floyd's death, and certainly you know, you've read, it's really a, a much deeper issue than I think many of us understand, certainly myself as a white person. Uh, but I know as a church, as a pastor, uh, we 
we need to be thinking about this. We need it to affect our hearts. Um, I, I gotta say, I, I've been ignorant to this, uh, to the issue of racism, to how uh, black people, the black community are affected and, and what they have to go through. But we as a church, we wanna love and support um, people who are oppressed. And so uh, while we don't know everything, we wanna commit to learning about it. Uh, there are some things we know. We know that we are created in the image of God. Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, tells us that all people were created equally with God's image in us. And so we have a dignity because of that. All of us do. Um, secondly, we know that Jesus, when he prayed for us, when he prayed for his followers, he prayed that we would be one. Just like him and the Father were one. And no, that doesn't mean that we're colorblind. What it means is when we see brothers and sisters who are being oppressed, who aren't experiencing justice, who aren't experiencing equality, we need to stand up for them. And maybe for some of us that just starts with learning, learning about the issue, uh, asking people who are black, how can we uh, not be ignorant? How can we be supportive? How can we stand for justice? Uh, but then lastly, I know that when you get to the end of the Bible in Revelation, uh, when we get the picture of heaven, it says that every nation, every tribe, every language is going to be singing praises to God. And so uh, God's picture of the church, of, of his creation was for all people, all colors, all languages, all backgrounds to be worshiping him. And we as a church, we as Calvary, we want that to be our church right now uh, as it is on earth, in heaven here on earth. And so I want to take a moment and just stop and pray. And specifically, I want to pray for the black community who, who are severely affected right now, who are hurting, who want justice. And no, that doesn't mean that there aren't other issues going on in our world. I know there are. But right now, we're going to stop and we're going to focus on this. So would you join me as we pray? Father, I personally admit that I... Um, I've really had to evaluate my heart this week and, and realize that I can be quite ignorant to what other people go through. And, and this week we are praying, we're praying for the family of George Floyd who, who is in so much pain right now and they just want justice. They, they, they probably, I'm guessing, want George back. And, and uh, we pray for, for those who their entire lives simply because of the color of their skin have been treated differently. Lord, I, I can't even imagine what that feels like, but Lord, uh, break our hearts for what breaks yours. I pray that um, people within our own Calvary community, those who are, who are black, that they would know they're supported, they're loved, that we will do anything we can to stand with them. Uh, Lord, I pray for all of us that we would take time uh, in this week, in this moment in our history to evaluate our hearts, the, the racism that might be there, the prejudice that might be there, the ignorance that might be there. I pray we would all take the time to learn how we can love like Christ first loved us. I pray we would be the church, not just by saying a bunch of nice stuff, but by living differently because of what Jesus has done in our lives. And I pray this all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living home. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory. Spoken, I am forgiven. The 
King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. That sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Jesus, your Do you see the culture around you and just wish things were different? Have you been reading about and hearing about and watching what's going on in our world and just knowing that something needs to change? Maybe for you it's not even out there in our world. Maybe it's right at home in your personal relationships, in your community, in your neighborhood. As you look around you, you just realize something needs to change in our culture. I need to be a part of positively influencing the people around me. But I have no idea where to start. I'm just one person. How could I possibly make a difference in the world around me? Well, if you can relate to any of these kind of feelings, uh, I want to take you to a story that I think will help us. And now, right off the bat, I want to say it's probably not going to answer all of your deep questions because those are some serious things that you're probably wrestling with, but I think it can help us to get started. If we really want to make a difference, if we want to impact our culture, I think the story of Paul, maybe you've heard his story before, I think it has so many lessons to teach us. You can find his story in Acts chapter 18. Uh, we as a church have been traveling through the book of Acts and looking at the real events that took place in Paul's life 2,000 years ago. And here's what was going on for him. As he looked at the cultures around him, as he saw the way people lived their lives and, and some of the ideologies, some of the, some of the deeply ingrained systems and, and injustices, uh, people, the way people were treating each other, Paul realized, I need to be a part of the change in our culture. I need to make a difference. And so he committed his life to making a difference. And he was so convinced that one of the ways he could do this is by bringing the message that had changed his life, the message of Jesus to other people people. Now, before you tune out, before you check out on me, 
I want to ask you to listen to the rest of Paul's story. Because no, this isn't just some Jesus propaganda. If you wouldn't call yourself a Jesus follower, I believe Paul's life, his example, can actually still teach you some important principles for how you could change culture, how you could influence the culture around you. But if you are a Jesus follower, if you'd call yourself a Christian, then Paul's life is going to show us if we want to change culture, if we want to influence culture with the message of Jesus, it is going to be an uphill climb. It's going to be a daily struggle, and we're going to need to be prepared for it to be a battle every single day. As we get to Acts chapter 18, uh, Paul has been traveling from city to city, and he, he, he had a strategy to go to major cities that would influence the provinces around them and to to build this team, to have a team of people he was mentoring and then kind of sending them out to teach the message to other people. And along the way in Corinth, he met this couple named Priscilla and Aquila and they become part of his team. And part of our story this morning has to do with them. They're, They're sort of Paul's protégés. And so he meets them in Corinth. He decides to take them to Ephesus. And here's what happens. Uh, Verse 19, they arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He had trained them for a year and a half and now he says, you are on your own. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. He says, I've got a couple things I need to take care of. But if God lets me, if God wills, I will come back. And so Paul continues. He's headed back home. He had a vow he made. He needed to go deal with that in Jerusalem. Meantime, he leaves Priscilla and Aquila to continue some of the stuff that he had started to impact the culture around them. Now, let's just stop a second. Imagine what this would have been like for Priscilla and Aquila. Your mentor brings you. He says, hey, you want to go on this trip? You want to start putting this into practice? All the things I've been teaching you. Let's go. We're going to go to Ephesus. We're going to impact that city. And when they get there, Paul leaves them. He does what I call the drop and go, the see ya. And so now you are ready to take on this huge challenge, changing the culture around you, influencing the people who you're doing everyday life with, except for your mentor left you, and now you're on your own. Have you been there before? It's the master electrician who gets a huge contract and then tells the apprentice, you're on your own, I'm going for lunch. It's the person who's been articling so that they can practice law. The senior partner says, we just got a huge case and I want you to take it. Students, it's your first ever job. Your parents take you to the door and drop you off and say, have a great day. It's now up to you. That's probably some of what Priscilla and Aquila were feeling. And the struggle begins as they try to make a change in the culture around them. In verse 24, they, they, as they're trying to teach and to explain to people, here's, here's how things can change. Here's the message that we have learned about Jesus. They bump into this guy named Apollos. Here's what it says. Meanwhile, a, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And so they start this trip, and their whole goal is to be teaching people about Jesus. And as they begin, they meet this guy who's not even teaching the message correctly. Uh, we, we discover in this passage, he's a smart guy. He's from Alexandria, which had one of the world's greatest libraries. He was well-read. He even taught accurately about Jesus. And he had this fervor. He had this passion. As my volleyball coach would say, he was en fuego. He had the fire within him to teach about Jesus. But he got the message a little wrong. So you're Priscilla and Aquila. What do you do in this situation? Do you blast him? <laughs> Are you like that... Uh, older married couple where you're always correcting each other? Are you going to point out what he's doing wrong? Is it like that situation in life group when someone answers the question and they say it kind of differently than you'd say it and and, you know the answer was a little incomplete and so you just kind of show them the better more mature answer? What do you do in this situation? Well, for Priscilla and Aquila, what they realize is we need to come alongside this guy. We need to teach him. And so here's what happens. He's teaching in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They don't blast him. They don't, they don't slam him. They don't um, try to make him look bad in public. They take him on his own and they say, hey, you, you were doing great. 
Uh, you just missed out on a little piece. You only had John's baptism, but, but then came Jesus, and Jesus had to die, and he had to rise again, and they probably taught him the rest of the message of Jesus. Uh, and so maybe they're thinking, yes, we did it. Uh, we're starting to influence people. Uh, lives are being changed. They send Apollos out. He goes back to Corinth and begins an amazing ministry there in Corinth. And, and so they're so excited. And, and along the way, Paul returns to Ephesus. Their mentor is back. And before they even get a chance to tell him what's been going on before he can even unpack his suitcase more problems in trying to influence the culture chapter 19 verse 1 while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard of this Holy Spirit. Paul said, Paul asked them, Then what baptism did you receive? They said, John's baptism. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. So, so what Paul is realizing here is, Again, we're trying to influence our culture for the, for the name of Jesus, with the message of Jesus. And again, they have run into ignorance, misunderstanding about Jesus. These guys uh, were believers, or at least they were followers of God, and they were trying to live for Him. But the problem is, their understanding was incomplete. They had gotten to the point of John, who was that famous guy in the Gospels, who came before Jesus and told people, Repent, turn away from your sins, because the kingdom of God is coming. But that's the extent of their learning. They were missing the key ingredient, which was Jesus. For them, it's like, it's like if you were trying to tell the history of the Toronto Blue Jays, but you left out Joe Carter's home run. It's like if you tried to describe the 2015 playoff run. Yes, I have to go that far back already. But you don't talk about Joey Bat's bat flip. Or, or it's like if somebody was in stocks during 2020 and looking back, if they told the story of the stock market this year and they left out COVID-19's influence on the stock market, you're missing such a key part of the story. And Paul sees this. He says, guys, 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 you're on the right track, but you are missing such an integral part of the story. And look what he says to them. John's baptism, verse 4 of chapter 19, was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 of them in all. Before Paul can even, again, be excited and just say, yes, God is doing something here, more trouble ahead. He takes these disciples into the synagogue. If you've been with us before, you know that's Paul's practice. He goes to the Jews and he teaches them about Jesus. But he takes these guys into the synagogue and for three months he's teaching them. And the resistance, the tension, the obstinance, our text tells us, is increasing. The Jews decide, I want nothing to do with your message. They even start to malign the name of Jesus. Every single day, Paul deals with this struggle. So he decides, okay, it's not working in the synagogue anymore. I'm going to go rent out a hall. He rents out the hall of Tyrannus for two years, day after day after day. Paul teaches in this hall. <clears throat> what a grind. Can you imagine being Paul and, and for three months and then after the three months, every day you're asking yourself, is it worth it? Am I making a difference to the people around me? Is my message having any impact? Are people's lives changing? Is culture any different? Or am I wasting my time? A three month grind. And we're almost right on that right now. Three months of our lives being way different than they were last year. You can experience, you know what it's like to be waiting that long to see something make a difference. Well, after two more years of this, we start to realize that yes, indeed, Paul's message was making an impact. Verse 11, actually, I'll go back to verse 10. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Eventually, Paul taught the message so much and sent out so many people that throughout a whole province, uh, throughout modern day Turkey, the message of Jesus was being heard. The word of the Lord. Uh, verse 11 tells us God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and there were illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. God was doing things that, that you 
don't always see every day. These were amazing miracles. The power of God in Paul's life was changing the people around him. But just in case you thought it was just going to stay good and everything was going to be positive, in creeps more trouble. Because some people hear about the power of Paul. Some people see the things he's able to accomplish and they say, oh, this Jesus thing, that works. I'm going to try it out. And so these exorcists and, and children, this might be a good time for your family to push pause. And, and parents, maybe you need to just explain to your children what happens next in the story. But these exorcists, these people who, who made a living off casting out evil spirits, they realize the power of Paul. And so they decide, I need to try this Jesus thing. They begin in trying to cast out demons, evil spirits, in the name of Jesus. One day they get to this man who was possessed by an evil spirit, and they say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we command you to leave him. And the demon says back to him, well, well Jesus, I know. And, and Paul, yeah, Paul I've heard of, but you? I don't know who you are. The man with the evil spirit jumps on these guys, seven of them, called the sons of Sceva. And he overpowers them. He beats them. They walk away bleeding and naked. You think, what is going on with this story? How, how could this happen after all this work, after two and a half years of Paul trying to influence Ephesus and change the things that were going on in their culture? And after all that, it's lost on one incident, on, on one group of people who are using and abusing the name of Jesus. How could God let this happen? It's over. It's all lost. Well, look at verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. What? The whole town, the whole city of Ephesus, they see what's going on and they realize, instead of thinking, okay, Jesus lost, Paul and his guys lost, they actually realize this name is so powerful that you do not mess around with it. And suddenly their lives are changed. Look what happens in verse 18. Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they counted the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. That's 50,000 days wages. That's like three or four people's salaries for life. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. What's going on here? How, how do we change culture? How did Paul change the culture of Ephesus? Well, as he committed to teaching the message of Jesus, as he, as he committed his life to sharing Jesus everywhere he went. God used those efforts to dramatically change people's lives, transform people's lives. What's happening here in Ephesus, uh, you might not know this, but this culture was known for sorcery, for witchcraft, for, for dark magic. Uh, there was a famous temple, uh, one of the ancient wonders of the world to the god Artemis, the Greek god Artemis. And in this culture, these kind of practices were really renowned. And Paul goes into the culture and he just day after day after day, him and his team bring the message of Jesus to the culture until the power of Jesus, the power of God in the culture begins to change lives. So much so that the people of the town realize the, the wrong of their ways and decide, I'm ready to change my life. I'm ready to be in on this thing called a relationship with Jesus. And they, they put all their stuff in this giant bonfire and they say, this is my old life. Metaphorically speaking, see you later. I'm done with it. I'm Team Jesus. You want to influence the culture around you. <clears throat> you want to change people's lives for good. You can't change the culture around you unless Jesus himself has changed your life. Unless there is a radical, noticeable difference in your life because of your relationship with Jesus, you are not able to to change. You're not able to influence other people's lives. And so the first takeaway that we need to have from this story is that you should be the change you want to see. And you think, I've heard that before. I don't think that's original to Andrew. I've heard it accredited to Gandhi. And no, Gandhi was not a Christian. But here's the thing. 
I think he was right that if we truly want to impact the people around us, if we want to impact the culture around us, we need to live it first. We need to practice what we preach. But if all you ever do is try to change your behavior, if all you ever do is try to live differently, I think Gandhi would have fallen short just a little bit because what you're missing is what Paul had. And that was the power of God working in him. And you say, Andrew, aren't Christians, isn't Christianity uh, one of the biggest reasons that we have so many problems with our systems and our society, especially in North America? And what I'd say to you, not true Christianity, uh, but here's the thing. Wherever the name of Jesus uh, is preached, is taught, is spoken in a culture, there will be people who abuse that name. There will be people who take that name and fraudulently use it for their own personal gain, their own political gain, their own economic gain. That's what was going on with these exorcists, these Jewish exorcists at the end or the middle of chapter 19. They realized, oh, wow, look what Paul's got. I'm going to try and use that name. And they were taught a very hard lesson. Do not use and abuse the name of Jesus. But everywhere you go, there will be people who abuse that name. But whenever it's just a name, whenever it's just a power, if it's just something that you can gain by using Jesus' name, you'll get religion and you'll get total destructive behaviors. The difference is a true Christianity, truly what Paul is teaching, the message of Jesus is about relationship more than it is about just using some name for gain. Paul had been impacted by a relationship with Jesus. These people in Ephesus, Jesus had totally changed their thinking. Those people who who knew John's baptism at first, when they understood about Jesus, when they realized it's not just repentance, although we do need to turn away from our former lives, when they realized I'll never be good enough on my own, but Jesus was good enough for me, and they put their faith in that, when they trusted that his death and resurrection could pay for their sins, it changed their lives. It transformed them, and they could begin to live that out in the culture around them. But what about you? What are the deeply ingrained ways of thinking? Maybe prejudices, maybe even racism. Uh, Maybe it's lifestyles from your past that you just refuse to let go of in the name of Jesus. If you truly want to make an impact, if you truly want to change the culture around you, just like the people in Ephesus, you need to light that fire and get rid of that stuff. Start to be the change that you want to see. And then secondly, what we can do is learn from the culture around us. Learn, uh, take time to educate ourselves and teach Jesus to that culture. Um, You see, that's what Paul was doing. He had taken time, he had committed his life to teaching Jesus to this culture. Uh, For two years plus three months, he spent every single day teaching this message that had changed his life to other people. Now think about it. In that culture, you work from about 7 to 11 in the morning, and then Paul rented out this hall of Tyrannus. So from about 11 to 4-ish in the afternoon, Paul would go and teach about Jesus. And then for the evening, from four to nine, he would go back to work. He was so committed to this message that he exhausted himself. But you say, I'm not Paul. He was, he was a gifted evangelist. How could I ever have the impact that he had? Well, what about Priscilla and Aquila? They were entrepreneurs. They were tent makers themselves. And they just decided, as I work, as I go out into my culture, I'm going to take the message of Jesus with me. And they were able to have such an impact on Apollos' life and other people within the Ephesian culture. Apollos himself, he was this uh, educated, this um, well thought out, probably this accomplished, this great communicator. And he had realized, if I take this message of Jesus, if I understand it and I take it to the culture around me, I can have such an impact. He goes to Corinth and he becomes such an important part of the church in Corinth. Or how about these Ephesians here? Uh, Have you heard of the letter Colossians also in your Bible? Probably that the way the Colossian church started was because one guy from Ephesus named Epaphras took Paul's message, took all the time that they had spent in in Ephesus and went out to Colossae and shared the message with people and the church was started. Later, Paul would write them and say, would, would commend Epaphras for his effort. Here's the point. None of us will accomplish anything 
in the spiritual battle, which if you didn't notice, this is a very real spiritual war that we're in. None of us will accomplish anything if we are not willing to labor to the point of exhaustion. That's how Ken Hughes says it. If you are not willing to invest blood, sweat, and tears, and years and years and years into faithfully teaching this message, well, we're not going to be able to accomplish anything. And so we go back to the example of George Floyd. We go back to, to the black community thinking, when will we ever see justice? When will white people and other people begin to understand what we've been through our whole lives? Well, if you want to do your part, if you want to help, if you want to change what's been going on in the culture around us, we have to learn. We have to listen to the stories of those who are suffering. And then we have to bring this message that can change people's lives to the culture around us. One of the very practical things that you can do, uh, right now media, we have an account with them as a church. You can message our office, office at calvarygospel.ca. One of their seers right now is on racism and justice, how we can work toward reconciliation. So take some time and just check that series out and you'll be able to understand how can I influence the culture around me? Could you imagine what would happen if we as a church uh, began to day after day be committed to this effort like Paul was? What would the culture around us be like? Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, the time that we've had in your word. Um, it really does feel like such a big thing to try to influence culture, to try to make a difference. We, we so often wonder where we can start, but I pray that today uh, we would start by trusting in your power, that realizing a relationship with Jesus, the message that he preached, the life that he lived, is where all of our power comes from. We pray we'd lean on his strength, that we would depend on him. And Lord, that we would at least do our part, that we would stand up and be educated, that we would want to be difference makers, that we would want to see a better world and a better culture and that we would take the name of Jesus to our culture and show them the hope that is there that we would uh, work for justice and equality and love and most importantly transformation that takes place in a relationship with Jesus thank you so much for him thank you for our church family thank you for the community that we're a part of we pray that we will continue to live for you and to give glory in everything we do to you in Jesus name we pray amen
hearts will cry, these bones will sing. It's your breath, and I love.